My name is Nancy Johnson. I was born on September 19, 1942. I come from Cork, Ireland. I was in the Legion of Mary for a time when I was young in, in Cork. And then when I went to England, I joined the Legion of Mary over there for a time. And then I met and fell in love with my husband, Mike, and we ended up getting married in, in St. Tarsus's Church in, in Camberley in England in 1965. And Mike was in the army, and so we went over to, um, we were posted to Cyprus. I was pregnant with our daughter. I mean, I prayed for a daughter. I asked our Blessed Mother to give me a daughter. The Lord gave me a daughter, and we called her Agnes. And then we went to Germany in 68, and we had um, Michael, and uh, my waters broke at six o'clock in the morning, and Michael phoned for the ambulance and the ambulance came. There was a blizzard happening and the ambulance ended up in the ditch. And I don't know, my, my labour was all in the ditch. And then we made it, thank God, we made it for 10, 20 minutes before the baby was born. So he was born healthy and well inside in the hospital. That was in 73. And then in 74, we came over to Australia. Then I got pregnant with our son in 75. And in 76 March, he was born. But I was in labor with him for three days because he was a very big baby. And the doctor was with me, but then he got so angry and he went out of, out of the ward. I said, dear Lord, please. And our blessed mother, I said, blessed mother, you know I'm in trouble here. And I said, please God, help me. And then there was, I was, I'd say, it was an angel that stood by my bed in a white coat. And I said, please, Please help me, I said, I can't get my baby out, he's stuck. And so he went out and brought the doctor back in. The doctor said, I'm sorry, my dear, I have to cut you. And I said, I don't mind, just get my baby out. When baby Peter was born, he was navy blue from top to bottom. And then they rushed him off to the uh, incubator to take care of him. I didn't see him for a couple of days. He was in the incubator for a while, he was 10 pound four. I wasn't able to get him out. I really believe that God sent an angel to help me, to, to save my baby. He was well and he's a lovely young man. Oh, he's 46 years of age now. Then I had a stirring to, to start the Legion of Mary and I went to um, Monsignor Walsh and um, I was after telling people about the Legion of Mary and how wonderful it is to be under the auspice of our Blessed Mother and to be able to go out and, well, not only it sanctifies ourselves, but it also helps to bring other people and to know, to, to tell them about our Lord. I gathered a few people and I went to Monsignor Walsh and he ran me out of the office. He wouldn't hear of it. And I said, Blessed Mother, he doesn't want it. I said, and she made me go back again. And then he said, I just wanted to see how, how you know, um, devoted were you to see if you could, you know, that my anger made you run and then you came back. And so he was all for it. And then he called an elderly lady from the Legion of Mary toward Melbourne and she came out and taught us the ropes and everything. And um, I had two babies at the time, so I couldn't take over to, to be the president or anything. So I was just the vice president. Alice Lees became the president and Joan Ross became um, the secretary and she was um, Monsignor Walsh's uh, housekeeper. when we were in Germany, I was smoking. I was 18 before I took my first cigarette. And um, my 15-year-old cousin gave me my first cigarette and I never thought I'd smoke at all. Then I be kind of became addicted to it. And then I smoked for six years. We were in Germany. I liked to do, well, I, was, I liked singing. So I was doing folk singing and I was on the stage. Singing, I knew I could reach notes and I couldn't because of my chest, so I gave up smoking. Now, because it was my bad habit, 
I never asked our Blessed Mother or our Lord to help me to stop because I thought it was my bad habit, I had to stop myself. And it took me four months to stop dreaming about them and thinking about them. Oops. It, drove, it drove me nuts. Mike used to say, here, have one, have one. Not meanly, only to put me out of my misery. He was telling me to have a cigarette. And I wanted to sing so badly, I didn't want to do that. So after four months, I was out of the smoking, and that was all right then. And then when our daughter, Agnes and Michael, were of age, I, we always taught them not to smoke behind our backs in case, you know, in case somebody would tell us, but always to be truthful and come and tell us that they wanted to smoke. And so we, um, they said, Mum, can we smoke? And I said, I'd rather you didn't, but I won't stop you. And it's this real social thing because like, there was Dad and Agnes and Michael sitting on the settee there and I'm sitting there and they're all sharing cigarettes between them. So I felt like, I felt out of it. And I thought, I'm going to have a cigarette. So I had a cigarette and then I started to smoke. And for those years that I hadn't smoked, my body was just making up for it. I was like, I couldn't stop. I went to the doctor and he says to me, are you smoking? And I said, I am. And he was so cross with me. He said, you stop right now. And I said, oh. I said, it's three weeks to Lent. I'll give him up for Lent. The closer we got to Lent, the closer we got to Lent, I was smoking. Instead of one, I was smoking two. I couldn't stop. It was terrible. It took over my whole existence, the smoking. I was saying, Blessed Mother, please help me. And Blessed Lord. And on the, Monday, on the Monday night before Strove Tuesday, I went down on my knees and I said, Dear Lord, please help me. I can't stop. And I went into bed and I um, got up in the next morning as if I never had smoked in my whole life. It had gone. The crave had gone. Praise and thank the Lord and our Blessed Mother. I was in the Legion for many, many years, and um, we touched a lot of people's lives. We, we brought our Blessed Mother and our Blessed Lord to a lot of homes, and a lot of people um, came back to the church. And um, then I started to feel a bit tired, and I, I said, Blessed Mother, I can't do it anymore. And then she came to me. She I was drinking a cup of Milo one night, and she, was, she came to me in the end of the cup, and I said, Oh, Blessed Mother, I'm sorry, I will continue to do it. I'll do God's work and help me, Blessed Mother, because I was feeling so tired. I thought I'd leave somebody else do it for a change. But when, the, when she came to me there like that, she sort of renewed me, my strength, and I continued to go along and do the Lord's work. And then I got a job in M&M's and then I was working there a couple of years and we were doing repetitive work. I loved the job and you were feeding the machines all the time, constantly, constantly feeding the machines. I really loved it, but it didn't love me and my shoulder got a terrible tear in it, but because I couldn't see anything, I didn't think anything could be that bad. And I didn't even go to the doctor or anything. I just used to take some Panadol to try and get on top of it but the pain was ferocious. And um, it got higher and higher and higher. And the pain I'm seeing got higher and higher. And then I went to the doctor and I asked him to give me something for the pain. And he said, I can't give you anything for the pain. He said, till you stop work. And I said, but I don't want to stop work. I love my job. And in the end, I had to stop working because it got so bad. The pain was up here like this. Very, very ferocious pain. He gave me some codeine forte or something and I was allergic to it and I was taking eight a day and I was literally frotting at the mouth, literally frotting at the mouth, terrible pains in my stomach but to try and get on top of the pain I had to take them because and they were making me so sick in the end I couldn't take them because I they were making me sicker you know I just had to put up with the pain and our Blessed Mother was up saying, Blessed Mother, please help me, I'm in terrible trouble here. And uh, we were down in Rosebud one day for my, and it was my birthday. 
And the doctor was after saying to me, we'll have to operate on your shoulder. And I was saying, no, I couldn't imagine anybody doing that. You know, it was so painful. Anyway, I refused the operation. And then we were down in Rosebud one day and I was in, oh, I really broke down and I started to cry. We were having a little meal and I started to cry. And I really believed the Lord led me, our blessed mother led me, took me by the hand, I'd say, and led me to the chemist in Rosebud at the time. This lady out of the blue came and she said, can I help you? And I said, I'm in terrible pain with my shoulder. I said, it's very painful, just like just hanging like that. And she said, I've got just the thing for you. And she went in behind the counter. She came out with a, with a sling and she tied it over my shoulder. She rested my hand into the sling. And there was like a hair's difference in the pain. Now the pain was up here and it was like a hair's different in the pain. I started crocheting and I started my tear all over again and then that started to ache all over again and the doctor sent me um, to um, a physiotherapist and he insisted, this physiotherapist, he insisted that was my neck and I said there's nothing to do with my neck, I said it's my shoulder and he wouldn't listen to me and he started working on my neck and then I said please, I said it's not my neck, I said it is my shoulder in the meantime, my shoulder froze and I was going to the doctor and they were putting injections and this and that and the other thing into it and nothing was working. And um, it was in 2004, in January 2004, the potter priest came from over from India and um, I was only helping to serve the food with one hand. You only need one hand to serve the food. And I was after doing that. I couldn't wash up or anything because you need two hands to wash up. And so I went in and they were all praising God inside in the hall and I just joined in praising the Lord. In the meantime, when I worked in the hospital, I was uh, using caustic soda for cleaning the ovens at the time. And my sense of smell went. So I had no sense of smell for about 15 years. And um, I used to burn all the dinners and um, it was only one person at Holy Family knew that I shared with that, that was Monique Onizine, that I shared with her, that I had no sense of smell. We were down there every Monday, her and I, we used to do the envelopes while the men, while the others counted the money, we used to put the envelopes in order. And she said to me one day, she said, um, Nancy, she said, there's a terrible smell in the fridge, can you smell it? And I said, no, I have no sense of smell telling her what happened. And, um, and I, she said, open it. And I opened the fridge and I couldn't smell anything. And anyway, with Father Mondokai, that day, after I'd been in there for about 20 minutes, Father Mondokai said, the Lord is healing people that haven't had a sense of smell for many years. And I said, Lord, is it me? And the Lord said, yes. And I said, me, like that. And he said, come up. And when I went up, our blessed Lord was in the monstrance and I bowed to him. And then I went over to the priest and he put his hand on my head and he says, what can you smell? And I said, everything. And this lady come and put some perfume on me and my head shot back like that. And I went back to my seat, joyously praising God and thanking our blessed mother. And it was amazing the way it happened. And I was there for another while praising God and thanking him and our Blessed Mother. And the next thing, uh, the priest said, the Lord is healing people with bad shoulders. And I didn't say to the Lord, this time is it me, because my arm just shot up like that. Praise be to God. It broke, he broke the shackles of the, um, of the frozen shoulder that I had. For two years, it was stuck like that. Praise be to God. How wonderful God is. Or 
never sought thy intercession was left unaided was left unaided because i came off the i'm a diabetic and because i came off the um the insulin for 10 months which i felt really good with those and um but they they blent my toe getting septic for that reason agnes and i went down to the hospital dr amos came in and without saying good afternoon or hello or anything he just said he said your toe has to be amputated and uh, he sent another specialist into me and he said to me he said if it's not your toe it'll be your foot or your leg or your life and so i had to say all right then you know that i'd have it and i said you know just you know you're just taking off the top of my toe with the hammer on it like and they said no we have to take it all off and i said no i can't have it all off but i didn't i didn't want to have it all off i thought how am i going to walk how am i going to do go up there and do the lord's walk you know i thought i wouldn't be able to put a shoe on or anything they sent me home after five days with them um, 11 antibiotics and i took them for the two weeks that I had him. And then they told me to get more from my own doctor. And then I started to take them. And then I turned into a lobster. They, they, they just didn't agree with me anymore. And I had to stop because my whole body became like a red raw lobster, is all I can say. And then I had to go on anti and what do you call them? anti infest me or something. You have to take to counteract that. So I was on them for a whole week to get it out of my system. In the meantime, they were still dressing my toe every second day. And it still looked like it was just dug up and buried and dug up. And then on the, on the Friday, I saw a different doctor. And um, he was one of the doctors that I had seen earlier on in the piece. And the nurse was the same nurse that I'd seen from the beginning. And she said, Nancy, your toe isn't healing at all. You have to have it operated. You have to have it off. So I phoned uh, Kimberly. She was the assistant to the, um, to the sergeant, Dr. Amos. And uh, she was ringing me on and off and telling me how urgent it was that you have to get it done, you have to get it done. And I wasn't ready. And I was talking to our Lord and our Blessed Mother, and I'm saying, please help me here, Blessed Mother. It's not easy to lose your whole toe. I said, I don't mind losing the top of my toe. They prepped me all in everything. And the next thing, there was an emergency. Some young boy had to have a kidney transplant. So I was praying for that young fella. And then looking around then, you get your sort of bearings where you are. And I saw there was a man that didn't look very well and I was praying for him. And then I said to the nurse that before I go down, I'd have to go to the toilet. And the next thing, the curtain opened alongside of me. And this lady said to me, are you Irish? And I said, I am. And she said, so am I. And uh, we chatted away and then she told me she had a 10 week old baby and her, she had, was diagnosed with cancer of the stomach. So I started to pray for her. And it took four hours for the operation for this other person. And then when it came for my turn, then down I go and they prep me and put in the, um, the needle for the anesthetic and um, got me ready and brought me into the theater and put me onto the bed. And there was Dr. Amos and Dr. Lily and there was a window over there where all the people looking in, like all, I suppose, young interns that would come in to learn how an operation is performed on an amputation, you know. There was uh, Dr. Amos there and Dr. Lily there, and there was this person standing there in the middle of them, and he still had a jacket on, he didn't have no mask on, and he had a, his kind of bag over his shoulder, and he's, and he, he took this, the, Dr. Amos had the scalpel in his hand and he took it off him and he just went to me toe like that and he said, we won't be amputating on your toe. We won't be taking your toe off, he says to me. And I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Dr. Stephen. And I 
cut, he came up to me and I cut him and I said, thank you, thank you very much. I said, you're an angel sent by God. I said, thank you, thank you, God bless you. And then the whole place was full of people and they were all so amazed that such a thing had happened. They said in all their existence, they had never ever seen anything like that in their life. And I said, you've got to give witness now. I said, because that was God answering prayer. I said, God has answered my prayer. You know, I said, you must give witness to that. And I said, I will give witness to that. Because I said, you know, ask and you shall receive. Believe that you have received and it will be given unto you. Then they put me into the, um, the ward where you're sort of for recovery. And they gave me a cup of tea. And then I saw the little boy that was after having the, um, the transplant and his young mother was there and she was ro roaring and crying. And I called her over and I told her what happened. And I said, don't fear. I said, talk to our blessed mother. Our blessed mother, I said, will look after your son and our blessed Lord will take care of him. I said, don't, don't despair. Our blessed mother was with me all the time. I walk with Mary and talk with Mary all the time. Regardless of where I go or what I do, our Blessed Mother is always with me, just like my mother, just like my sister, just like my friend. She's with me in everything I think and do and say. And I offer everything up through her to our Blessed Lord and our Blessed Mother. My name is Michael O'Neill and I'm the Miracle Hunter. And there have been stories of miraculous icons from all around the world through Christian history. And today we're going to look at one of the most famous modern examples, and that is Our Lady of Akita from 1973 in Japan. And the story goes like this, that there was a, a nun, her name was Sister Agnes Sasagawa, and she was deaf. And she actually one night saw some great lights that she followed down the hallway and went to the chapel there, and she saw an image of an angel appearing before her. And after that, that apparition, she saw that the wooden statue in the style of Our Lady of All Nations began to emanate messages to her, locutions. And later the statue began to bleed in the hand and tears flowed 101 times from that incredible statue. And so over the course of years, she reported these locutions to her local bishop, Bishop Ito, who did an investigation that at first rendered no results declaring it as supernatural. But after consulting with uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the future Benedict XIV and the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, he suggested that they do a second investigation. And in this investigation, they came out with the results in 1985 that said these were in fact human blood, human tears that were found to be coming from that statue. The messages of chastisement, of bishops turning against bishops in the church, a great tsunami and great uh, raining fire from the sky that was predicted to happen, those messages may or may not be necessarily approved by the Catholic Church. It's a great controversial message, but those events of Akita, those uh, bleeding, that bleeding statue, that crying statue, and the cure from deafness of Sister, Sister Agnes Sasagawa are one of the things that make this one of the most incredible stories in the history of our Catholic Church. And that was Our Lady of Akita from Japan in the year 1973. My life is a miracle. 
Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.